Okay, welcome everyone that's joined us here in Council Chambers for a meeting of Pocosin uh, City Council. This is Monday, December 14th. And uh, get all please rise. So leave in the invitation and pledge allegiance. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for the many blessings we have received as a city in this past year. As we head into a new year, keep us ever mindful of those in this holiday season who need either a helping hand or just a neighbor that we have overlooked in some way. Help us all to reach out to those around us, all of our neighbors and all of our friends, and all of those hurting in any way. As we deliberate the issues before us this evening, we ask for your guidance, as always, and a special blessing this holiday season for our military, especially those serving in foreign lands, and for our public safety officials as they protect all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Before we get started this evening, Council, I'd like to make sure everybody's okay. Uh, know that we're expecting uh, Mr. Bill Thomas from Hampton, uh, really Dr. Bill Thomas from Hampton University. I don't think he's joined us yet. When he does come, I do plan on letting him do his presentation. He has called ahead, and uh, um, we certainly uh, want to hear from him. Uh, so we'll do that when uh, he arrives. Other special presentations, we'll start with the audit presentation and Mr. Belot uh, of the firm of Cherry, Eckhart, and Holland uh, have done the audit on the city of Pocosin. And as always, we look forward to your report. Thank you, Mayor Hunt, members of the council, Madam Clerk, Mr. Wheeler. Thanks for having me tonight. Uh, in addition to the uh, formal audit report itself, I have some comments that I'm required to make about the conduct of the examination. Um, First and foremost, of course, we were engaged to audit the financial statements of not only the city, but the school board and the Economic Development Authority. Additionally, we audit the city's major federal programs for compliance with laws, regulations, and grant agreements that go on, and in accordance with the uh, Auditor of Public Accounts of the Commonwealth of Virginia's specifications for audits of cities, counties, and towns. So having said all that, uh, first and foremost, the, the audit opinions are unmodified or a clean opinion. Our opinions this year do contain an emphasis of a matter a paragraph, and that has to do with the implementation of technical standards, GASB statements number 68 and 71, which have to do with uh, pension accounting, uh, financial and reporting for pension costs. For the first time ever, the liability for the pension plan has been brought onto your full accrual or government-wide financial statements. You noted no uh, matters of non-compliance with the federal laws and regulations that are re re required to audit in accordance with the Office of Management and Budget as required by uh, Statement A-133 or a single audit as you may know it. Financial statements require management to make estimates. Uh, examples of estimates are allowance for uncollectible accounts, the pension liability, other post-employment be benefits, or the group health insurance to retirees. During this past year, we proposed no audit adjustments, nor were there any uncorrected misstatements that we passed over. There was no disagreements with management having to do with our audit scope or accounting principles that are applied. We had no difficulties in performing the audit this year and were not aware of any consultations with other accounting firms which be akin to gaining a second opinion. Cherry Beckert is, was, still remains independent. Independence is an important part of uh, what we do. We are somewhat a public watchdog to overlook these financial statements and to provide assurance that those statements are fairly presented in accordance with the accounting standards that they have them. 
all existing accounting principles in the statements have been uh, consistently applied throughout the year, except for the change required by the pension accounting. Going forward, there are a few that you'll be looking at uh, for the fiscal year that year, and there is a statement number 72 that deals with the fair value measurement of assets and liabilities that we'll be dealing with in your statements. Uh, a year after that, there'll be some new footnote disclosures that have to do with tax rebates and the type of programs you have and the magnitude and volume of those. And lastly, in 2018, the GASB decided they put their your net pension liability on the financial statement. Well, guess what? The OPEB liability will be coming on your statements uh, in fiscal 2018. I'd like to take a moment on Cherry Becker to express our thanks to the Finance Department of the City of Pocosin in getting through this effort. I know they have their regular jobs in addition to a team of auditors running around looking at things that happened six, eight, ten months ago and asking questions about it. Uh, if there's any questions, that concludes my formal comments. Council? I don't think we have any questions, but let me let me... Uh, on behalf of council, let me thank you uh, for the services that you provide and uh, the basically the independent look at our finances. I think it's vital. Uh, it's it basically is uh, as as I've said for many many years. The important thing about being able to govern is trusting the numbers, and when we can trust those numbers we can make decisions because you can normally resolve just about anything as long as you know what you're really dealing with. Your audit of our finances is important to us. And I, you know, even uh, came up there several times and your team is so professional and uh, so well-meaning. So yeah. we really appreciate the time that you've provided to us. And uh, as well, we, pr we appreciate the findings. Well, I okay. wish you all a happy holiday and a prosperous new year then. Okay. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Next item is the introduction of new employees. And Randy, I'll let you do Mr. the honors here. Members of the council, I hope that we have two. Um, the, uh, the first, if she's here, is Rebecca Weimert from the library. Rebecca, are you here? Didn't see her. So we'll move on. We'll move I'm pleased to introduce a, a very professional and cleaned up looking Mike Snap, who spends uh, his days working very hard in some very dirty places, and I'm glad to have you here, Mike, and he's going to introduce our newest employee, Chad. Mr. Mayor, City Council, I'd like to introduce Chad Kajarek to the Utilities Department. Okay. Sir? Tell us, about you, tell us about yourself. Well, sir, I just recently retired from the Navy in August. Okay, uh, great. 26 years went by pretty fast. Uh, so since then, I was looking for a job, and I know Mike personally, so I found out this job was opening up, so I applied for it, went through the process, and here I am, glad to be here, uh, glad to serve this fine city. Uh, I met a couple people earlier. I look forward to meeting everyone else a little bit further um, in the future. Um, I know you guys are very busy tonight. Uh, my wife is, uh, I think, third, fourth generation from the city of Picosa. Great. So I recently got married last summer. Moving. So living here off of Pasture Road, so glad to be here. Hey, so. we're, we look forward to working with you. You're going to find Pocos in a very different place, um, and we don't, you know, don't do all that Navy stuff. <laughs> now, you'll be, uh, so you'll be working on the uh, the CHT system that yes, we sir. have here in the city of Pocos. So Yes, sir. Yeah. But uh, looking forward to your, your service. Thank okay. you. Thanks a lot. Okay, and um, the last special presentation for the evening, I'd like to introduce Jessica Wood, who will come up, and she would like um, to make a short presentation on the city's new website, which is uh, still, we're, we're still making improvements to it and refinements, but it's a significant change, and Jessica and a team of employees um, under the general other duties as assigned that you often get in the city of Picosin. Jessica is, uh, uh, works in our finance department uh, when she's not also doing a whole bunch with our website and social media. And she led the team, and she'll introduce her team members, the ones that are here, and uh, walk us briefly through this uh, new tool. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, you guys uh, for um, the opportunity to do this quick introduction um, to our new website. This went live in uh, mid-November, and I wanted to thank the committee that worked on this. I don't know that anybody's here, but it was Amy Blow from the library, Gretchen Gokenauer from Community Recreation, Krista Corbett from the Fire Department, Vicki Diggs from the City Manager's Office, and Joe C., whose last name I always <laughs> butcher from schools, and he was our IT um, person. So here on the screen, you'll see our new site. Um, um, at the top here, we have um, our Bacosan is the place symbol along with our name. Uh, from anywhere on the website, you can click on this Bacosan is the place symbol and it's going to bring you right back to the home page. So that along with these menus here show up on every single page. Um, these menus have um, all the information you can link to um, everywhere on the website. Uh, the... Um, Departments are all listed here, as well as contact information for each department. And um, you'll also notice that under the How Do I section, we have a um, small area right now that we are working on expanding of where um, people can report issues, um, things like street light outages, garbage problems, recycling issues. So, And also, under the Government section, um, under the... Let me scroll down here. Well, there it is, City Council. Um, on the Council page, there um, is a link to view the archived uh, Council meetings um, to YouTube. And then we are currently testing the ability to do the live streaming on YouTube. So we hope to have that fixed up here shortly. Um, as you scroll down the page, you will notice that we um, have a citizen service center where uh, people can check um, for employment and pay bills, uh, see the budget, and um, go on our GIS. Underneath there, we have a few quick links and um, calendars. Uh, the thing that this website offers us that was not available under the last website we had that I'm personally very excited about is the ability to do a notify me. Um, if you'll see up at the upper right hand corner, there's my picture. I'm logged in as me. Um, and um, this gives me the ability to sign in. Um, I signed in using Facebook, but you can use Yahoo. You can just... Uh, put in your information manually, and create an account. Now, you certainly do not have to create an account. You can just browse the web page. But by uh, signing in, you have the ability, uh, if you go to the Notify Me section, you can sign up to receive emails. And I don't know if you can tell, but um, like I have signed up for to see, receive emails for construction alerts. There's a little green checkbox next to the area. Um, one thing that we really like about it as well is we have set up a calendar for recycling. So I live on the blue recycling route, so I have signed up for the blue recycling calendar. So every <coughs> Thursday I get an email, well not every Thursday, every other Thursday I get an email reminding me to put out my recycling for Friday morning. Uh, there's also a red recycling calendar. And if you go to the solid waste page, if you don't know what color route you are, there's a listing on there with the colors. So you can sign up for your appropriate calendar. So um, that's really all I have to share, unless anybody has any questions. But I wanted to thank you guys once again for the opportunity. And we appreciate it. Council, any questions? It's, just, it's great. It's great. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah. Thank, very you nice. thank you for the work. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. you know, that other jobs as a sign doesn't, you know, <laughs> sometimes goes unnoticed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, now that we know this, that you can do this this much oh, no. good things. You know, I'm sorry, I didn't mention we hired a firm. <laughs> it wasn't okay. done, I didn't HTML it or anything uh, like a, that. I just, no good deed goes unpunished. So, you know, we'll, we'll yeah. probably uh, be counting on you for more. But, no, thank you thank seriously you. for what, for this work. Thank and uh, it's, it's definitely uh, been a long time coming, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Okay. That's everything that I see. You did not show up yet. Okay. 
Uh, we'll move forward to the audience for visitors. Uh, I'll remind everybody that we do have a public hearing this evening. If you're here to talk on the uh, conditional use permit uh, uh, section, I would ask that you hold those uh, comments until that portion of the meeting. Um, and Evie, you brought me this one sheet. Is this an audience for visitors? Okay. All right. Uh, so if there's somebody that wants to address council on another any other issue other than that public hearing, now is that time. Okay, seeing none, I'll close the audience for visitors and uh, ask council for consideration of the minutes. Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt the minutes of the regular session of November 9th, 2015. Second. A motion made and seconded that we adopt the minutes of the meeting um, of November 9th. Questions or comments, changes? Seeing none. Judy? Councilwoman Crawford? Aye. <clears throat> Councilman Ayer? Aye. Councilman Southall? Aye. Vice Mayor Freeman? Aye. Councilman Bernal? Aye. Councilman Green? Aye. And Mayor Hunt? Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of 7 to 0. Okay. And uh, the next item on the agenda is the public hearings. And the first item, or the only item under public hearings, is an ordinance amending the zoning ordinance to require a conditional use permit for high traffic generating uses in the general commercial district. And Randy, uh, who's going to present? Uh, Mrs. Best will present. She'll summarize the proposal in front of you as remanded by the City Council. Mm -hmm. Recap the Planning Commission's consideration and their recommendation with regard. Um, council members uh, will, will note that um, the language pursuant to the proposed change uh, recommended by the Planning Commission is in the staff report, should you wish to incorporate it. And for those watching us at home, um, I don't know if at some point we'll put it up, but there's there's almost always a question about where is general commercial, and rather than try to simply explain where it is uh, sort of in the ether, there is a, a map about halfway in through your package on this item. The uh, GC properties are the ones in purple. Thank you, Ms. Beth. You did an excellent job. I can go sit down now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Not getting away that uh, Anyway, I thought I'd try. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of City Council. Uh, Mr. Wheeler summarized where we're at right now with this ordinance um, at your request from your November 9th meeting. If you remember that evening on, uh, you had asked or remanded back to the Planning Commission, or excuse me, you had asked staff to look into creating an ordinance language that would basically require a conditional use permit for certain uses that were constructed or were um, established along the or in the GC district. Please keep in mind that the GC district is located on the north side of Victory Boulevard and extends westward from the Kentucky Taco Hut to City Hall Avenue. Um, it's the northeast portion of the Big Woods. Um, however, when that district was first created back in the mid-90s, the uses that were allowed in the district were based on the uses that we presently allow along with Creek Road, which is the B2 district corridor. That is our general commercial corridor with some scattered uh, B2 located along our waterfronts. When we were tasked by City Council to develop the ordinance language, what we did um, from a staff level is we looked at the existing uses in the B2 district those uses that are permitted by right and do not require a conditional use permit. This B2 district is um, categorized in two separate areas. You have those or divided in two separate areas where you have uses as permitted by right and then uses that require a conditional use permit. We, of course, focused on the uses were permitted by right. And before you this evening in the ordinance is a list of those uses uh, that you guys take, looked at in your November meeting, kind of blessed it, and we moved it through the Planning Commission at their meeting last Monday night. <coughs> uh, the Planning Commission is recommending approval of this list, <coughs> excuse me, which includes requiring a conditional use permit for certain retail uses, such as grocery stores, uh, discount stores, variety stores, <coughs> excuse me, and shopping centers, um, medical facilities such as hospitals and um, trauma centers, 
um, governmental office buildings, such as libraries, this building, as well as museums. You always do this. Thank you. It's an exciting subject. Isn't it? I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's been wonderful. <laughs> excuse me, recreational uses, which would include uh, indoor, outdoor theaters, exercise facilities, bowling alleys, skating rinks, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And restaurants with drive through facilities. The Planning Commission agreed with this list. However, and in addition, they proposed that you consider amending the list to include one other section which would require a conditional use permit for any use located in the GC district that generated 75 vehicle trips or more per hour. This would capture maybe some of the activities that's not in, listed in this um, ordinance this evening. And a great example of that, <coughs> Kevin and I were talking about it today, is that you have two sit-down restaurants. One is a small hometown restaurant compared to maybe like uh, Outback mm. with high traffic turnover. So with the Planning Commission's recommended change, it would capture the Outback style use where it's not covered in this list here. And it's very difficult to create a list that's going to cover every potential establishment that ever comes to the city. So that was the purpose of this recommendation from the Planning Commission. And other than that, they were in agreement with what you all, what you had asked for them to, to, to look at. So okay. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Questions? Uh, I just wanted for just general reference, uh, the 75 traffics per hour. Can it, I mean, what does like Farm Fresh or McDonald's or what do they generate? Because the number by itself doesn't mean a lot to me without something to kind of compare it to. Do you have any idea? Well, those type of use is already covered in this list. Well, I know. I'm just wanting to know 75. Well, I don't know exactly. What does 75 yeah. mean? I think is what you're. It essentially yeah. means one vehicle slightly less than every two minutes for an hour. Right. Well, I can I mean, do the uh, Beyond yeah. that, yeah. An, an, an do, we have, do we have a comparison? An equivalent. <coughs> Excuse yeah. me. An example. Don't. Like, does Wendy's create some number or? You know, we we, we didn't do a traffic study. We'd have to go back and pull out the old. So I mean, we don't even have an <laughs> estimate to compare to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I had two questions. I mean, one of them was similar to, to uh, Carrie's, and that was was the 75 trips per hour, uh, a, an industry standard of some kind. And the other one was um, how much additional cost are we putting on potential businesses that might want to come into the city uh, that uh, don't exist here now? Do you have any idea how much the additional cost would be for them to to start a new business, and, and I, I think also with the credit unions in the general commercial district, is it not? It is. Yes, sir, it okay. is. That's a number <clears throat> that's hard for me to say, but I would venture that a traffic study that's you know, provided by a professional engineer, depending on the depth of the study, but for our purposes, I think it would be between five and $10,000. That's a lot. So we might be pricing somebody out of even thinking about it. It could be for smaller type uses. For, you know, new users or new uses, it could certainly have an impact on it. And, and who would, you know, I'm thinking about the traffic study. Do you, do you get the 75? Who, who provides us with the number 75? And is, do you come up with a 75? Let's say we're talking about the credit union. You know, they're only open a certain number of hours in a day. Are they going to divide their number of tra traffic visits by 24 hours in a day, or do they divide it by the number of hours that they're open? How be during their operation hours with emphasis on the peak hours of operation. Okay, that's how you come up with that number, 75? Yeah. I think it, it basically, as I recall uh, in the notes here, it basically says during peak hour. Is that correct? And it could be any way. 
But I'll, I'll remind council that that's something that we would have to insert because what's advertised does not include that. Right, right. I, but I think that's a good. I think it's a good yeah. idea. I'm just. I just want to make a sure lot of government. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. if I could, you could save Debbie than having to speak to this because she can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> you for the first all. time, huh? I come um, back. <laughs> you know, one of my first questions in hearing about the proposed revision was, do you have to do a traffic study to decide if you need to do a traffic study? Yeah. Right. You know, um, yeah, and there is, a, there is a national standards book that Kevin got out, and we walked through different kinds of businesses. So there's a, there, there's a national standards book that projects traffic by types of business, and size of business and so the first thing we would do if something was close would we'd go to the standards book to see if we thought it would reasonably qualify rather than requiring a study to determine if a study was required. So oh. you can use that number and not require the traffic study? No ma'am. Uh, I wasn't clear. To determine whether or not there would be sufficient vehicle traffic to trigger the 75. Oh, okay. It'll say you know a, a small restaurant is this much traffic per per thousand square feet at peak hour. Yeah. Um, I'm not explaining it very well, but, but there is a there is a there is a there's a it's standard a standards book on that. Okay. So for a small business, they might be able to use those standards and, and determine that they don't have to do the traffic study. Yeah. We would work with them to determine if they had to or not. If if it triggered, then uh, the answer would be yes. Um, is this a more restrictive requirement than our neighboring communities have as far as requiring that traffic study? You know, we're in competition with every other locality around us to attract business, and if we have one more thing that's not quite as uh, convenient and supportive of business, that puts us one step further behind. We already don't have the kind of industrial parks and developed areas where we say, here's the infrastructure, everything, all you got to do is put your building here and you're ready to go. So I'm just concerned it may be one more thing that's going to cause us to not be able to attract businesses. I talked to uh, a development lawyer yesterday, and I can't give you the names, but he said that just about all surrounding uh, localities have something very, very similar to this. Oh, something similar to that. That's, yeah. well, that's good to know. Wayne, do you know about other localities nearby that have similar ordinances to this? I do not. Do you know any, do you know any that don't? Or you don't know any, one way or the other? I haven't checked any of the surrounding uh, I haven't checked the county or you can use the Hampton to see what they have. And you don't know either, Kerry? Uh, no, we didn't get into the details okay. of who does or who doesn't. He just made a general statement that most surrounding communities have a similar type uh, requirement. It's something you can determine by simply going online. Every, every one of these jurisdictions have their zoning ordinance online. You can check it out fairly quickly if they do have uh, those types of things. Uh, it only... Not, not express an opinion one way or the other. The only thing it's, if I would point out to you, says, or any other use projected to result in 75. So who's going to project it? Because the applicant's not going to project it. That was my question. So, right. I have my hand. I mean, somebody's got to project it, which means then it's going to fall back on the city to project whether or not the city thinks. And then it goes back and says, okay, we project more than 75, so now you have to do a study because... I mean, nobody in their right mind is going to come up and say, well, we're going to have 100, you know, vehicle tra yeah. tractions every hour. Captain, right over. Any other questions? Of oh, Debbie. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this is a, uh, a public hearing, so I'm going to open that public hearing and ask for... Uh, Speakers, I do have some people that have signed up, and once we get through those, and we'll we'll open the floor up to see if there's anyone else. Um, and again, this public hearing is only to address this particular ordinance. So uh, just try to stay aligned in your comments to this particular ordinance. All right, first speaker I've got is Alan Moody. Name's uh, Alan Moody, 207A Brown Snack Road. First of all, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to y'all. Um, I'm sure this will be the last time we meet this way this year, as I'm <laughs> 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 I think the 
28th will be canceled. Um, first, I'd like to address uh, some of the concerns that I, uh, I heard um, some of the council members uh, speak of. Um, first, one thing to remember that uh, this land is high dollar land over there. Um, so I don't think a small business is going to try to, to move in and be, be affected by a five to $10,000 traffic study. And if they are, in my opinion, that's the cost of doing business. One thing we have to remember as residents here, while we are competing to get businesses in here, we only have a two lane road in and out of here. We can't put something over there that is going to generate so much traffic that it's going to clog everything up because then businesses aren't going to want to build there because if they can't get their people in and out of the business, then they're not going to want to have a business there either. So it's kind of the cart before the horse, which one do you want to do? The road obviously needs to be improved, but it's not on the docket by Virginia to improve it. So we're kind of at a standoff there with that. Um, as far as this ordinance goes, it's not going to stop business. Yes, it may possibly add an expense to them. Uh, I would ask that y'all vote yes to the ordinance. Whether or not you want to accept the 75 or not from the Planning Commission, um, I do know that that number came from, from what I understood, an expert that's on the Planning Commission. That's his job as traffic <coughs> engineering, from what I've gathered. Very knowledgeable, speaks way beyond what I can comprehend uh, as far as traffic goes. He, uh, but that's where he got that number from, um, from knowing the ins and outs of the business. Um, this whole issue, we all know, started with the development that's going across the street. The, uh, this ordinance is not aimed at stopping any one development, but the development trying to go across the street, Crest did address and did show us that there was a problem. You can't address a problem until you know it exists. Now we know that there's a problem, that somebody can go over there and build without planning city council or the citizens having any say so in it at all and it could muck up traffic over there even more than it already is on victory boulevard um, so this ordinance does address that it does give the planning city council and us a chance to speak to it a chance to address traffic concerns and while possibly adding an expense i think it's one well warranted so that we can assure that we still have a safe passage and a low stress as possible getting in and out of here um, I would also like to ask you to use every tool in your tool bag I would ask that not only do you vote yes to this tonight I would ask that you forgo a second reading of this bill at your next council meeting allowing this to become law 30 days after you vote yes today while we're not trying to stop any development there's no reason for it to go unchecked for any longer than it has to Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Next uh, speaker is Mark Andrews. Good evening. Thank you for letting me uh, speak before you tonight. My name is Mark Andrews. I work. I live at uh, Seven Martha Court. Uh, before I go into my prepared speech, I've heard numerous times about small business. Let me just give you a little example. Um, my family's been developing real estate for thirty plus years. Uh, two acres here in downtown Pocosin, two hundred thousand dollars an acre. That's four hundred thousand dollars. It's going to cost you about two fifty three bucks a square foot to put in an asphalt parking lot. Another three hundred dollars a square foot to build a building. You're in it about three quarters of a million dollars five ten thousand dollar traffic impact study it's not going to make or break that project we're not talking small business like um, uh, mom and dad want to open up a comic book store in a 2,000 square foot space over here in in uh, the shopping center um, what we're talking about are projects that impact the city um, and with that let me because that's partly in my speech uh, over the past three months or so, the majority of the citizens of Pocosin have become united in their concern for the future development of their city. For some, it has been an issue of anti-growth. For some, it has been an anti-Walmart issue. And for some, still, such as myself, it's been an issue of managed growth. During my most recent speech to the Planning Commission, I made the statement, things are changing. And they are. They always will. 
but we can't allow change to happen simply for the sake of change. We need to see change coming, and we need to plan for that change. And planning for that change is what led to the adoption of the comprehensive plan, a plan to help manage change by laying the foundation for the future vision of growth for the city of Pocosin. Pocosin is one of the more desirable places to live in the Tidewater region due to its schools and moderate to upper income lifestyle. These attributes draw people who desire a small town feel, making the city a bedroom community for surrounding employment centers. Prudent development is paramount to continuing this upward socioeconomic trend. The city has designated the Big Woods area north of Victory Boulevard as the gateway entrance into the city, and that development within this district should require a village design of premier upscale retail and commercial uses. However, one of the biggest impediments to commercial development is the enormous cost of improving infrastructure. Employees, customers, suppliers, and merchandisers must be able to easily, economically, and safely reach their final destination and at a reasonable cost. Any inadequate or overburdened transportation system will only deter economic development. Most of the city's major collector streets have been realizing in tra increased traffic volumes over the years and are substandard to handle present and future traffic loads. In particular, Victory Boulevard is already under strain due to current traffic impacts, even prior to developing this specific area. Because of the lack of any near-term, or as of today, even long-term plans for improving Victory Boulevard, it is imperative you begin thinking about increasing the value of our investment in Big Woods by considering ways to finance the widening of Victory Boulevard. The ordinance before you is one step in that direction since it will allow the City Council final review of any project with the potential to impact both the City and its citizens. It will allow for the potential to have developers contribute to the infrastructure improvements or even deny the development due to negative impacts that the project may pose to the city. As I stated earlier, our future is changing. You need to see that change is coming and put in place the measures to protect the comprehensive plan, ensure the continual enhancement of our city, and maintain those endearing characteristics that make Pocosin the pride of its citizens. Therefore, I respectfully request you make a motion to dispense with the second reading of the ordinance and vote approval tonight as written. Thank you. And thank you. Okay, uh, Jana Andrews. My name is Jana Andrews. I live at 7 Martha Court. Um, this doesn't have to do with the ordinance, but I just wanted to say fantastic, beyond fantastic website, and to those who worked on it, thank you. <laughs> uh, we meet again at last. I'm here tonight to ask you to please pass the ordinance before you, as sent with the recommendations of the Planning Commission. It's vitally important to do what should have been done in 2008 when the comprehensive plan was adopted and what the state of Virginia has suggested in their state code jurisdictions do, which is create ordinances to give legislative bodies review over development with large impacts on their city. While some current development owners in the city seem very concerned about this ordinance, I would point out, as Debbie Vest said, that this ordinance applies just to the general commercial district on Victory Boulevard and not with Creek Road. However, as members of the Planning Commission have stated in some of their work sessions, and I agree, we need a similar ordinance for all of Pocosin because the comprehensive plan doesn't just apply to Victory Boulevard. And large development, which can greatly impact the city through many aspects, can happen in other places than Victory Boulevard. But I think it's also important to tackle and solve this problem that the city has realized they now have one step at a time. And I think this is an excellent first step. You can't stop change any more than you can stop the suns from setting. This ordinance doesn't stop development. It is to give you, our city council, and elected officials that represent the citizens the ability to make sure the change happens in such a way that the character of Pocosin, which has earned us safest and best place to live in Virginia year after year, is still maintained. So I'm not as good as Alan at talking off the, off the cuff, but I wanted to say some things based on the um, conversation you had. At one of the Planning Commission meetings, Kevin did look into other jurisdictions, and he can probably speak on that. I don't have my notes from that meeting. 
about other jurisdictions our size and what kind of size uh, requirements they have that would drive a development to city council. Um, I think he looked at Winchester. I don't remember what all of, the, all of them were, but almost every jurisdiction had a size trigger, which is not in this ordinance, which was any development over a certain size required a conditional use permit. It had to go before city council. In talking to Mr. Trant, who's on the EDA, he's a development lawyer, we had a conversation and he said many jurisdictions although we haven't looked into this, have not only a size trigger, but a traffic trigger. Because you can have something that's really small, you know, under, under your size trigger, but generates a lot of traffic, like a drive-through. So many jurisdictions have both a size trigger and a traffic trigger that requires that development to require a conditional use permit. And the whole point of that is because developments that either are extremely large or have a lot of traffic have a great impact on a city and therefore those jurisdictions want their city council to review those developments and that's the purpose for them and I think is what you know was the citizens driving force in this ordinance I would hate to see this ordinance not pass tonight because of the concern of cost of a traffic study so just thinking off the top of my head I would say if that's a concern for you would it be possible, I think it would be possible, to pass the ordinance requiring a conditional use permit, but maybe not require the traffic study and leave that up to you when you approve the conditional use permit, whether to determine if you want a traffic study, depending on the development that's come before you for the conditional use permit. Maybe that would, would be an option if that's a concern. Although, like many have said, that's a big area, and the likelihood of somebody going in there that's not putting in a million-dollar development, that that you know, would probably not be a, a cost concern for them. It would just be a cost of doing business. Um, it's my understanding that there is usually a second reading of an ordinance before it's passed, but I also have been told um, that you can also, by city employees that you can choose to waive that second reading. Given that this ordinance came about as a request of citizens and has ta been talked about at almost every city meeting since the end of August, I don't see any need to further delay in passing the ordinance or a need for a second reading. If you do feel like you need a second reading, then I would ask that you have that in December so that this ordinance can pass before the end of the year. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. We have a Susan Legan or Legan. I don't know which way. Legan for Inslee Circle. Okay. Um, I really don't have anything to add. Um, the former speakers all said everything that I agree with. Um, I just want to say that the Planning Commission, the EDA, and you um, city council members have been working hard since, I don't know, probably before August, but August is when I came in on all of this. And so I agree with everything that you guys have said. And, and, uh, those speakers have said. So I would encourage you to vote yes tonight and pass this ordinance. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, and Betty Dean. Regan's court. I spent at least two hours googling information about Walmart. I didn't count the number of negative articles about Walmart, but I can say that the negative articles far outweighed the very few positive articles about the advantage, so called, so -called advantages or benefits of Walmart. And to save time, I didn't include the names of the organization that wrote this information that I'll quickly present. Studies from all over the country show that Walmart's arrival does not bring the increase in jobs and retail ex spending that the company promises. Instead, Walmart captures spending from existing stores, driving them out of business. 
Walmart's entry into a new market has a strongly negative effect on existing real, real tables, retailers. Supermarkets and discount variety stores are the most adversely affected. Stores near the new Walmart are at increased risk of going out of business. According to another study, for every two jobs Walmart creates, three local jobs are destroyed. Last comment, when Walmart moves in, small businesses and jobs move out, and obviously traffic would increase after Walmart moved in. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, that's everybody who signed up. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on the site? Yes, ma'am. Just let us know your name and address. My name is Terry Gooding, and I'm from 77 Bunting Lane. And I spoke at the Planning Commission also and in support of this ordinance. And I've been around for 40 years, and I've seen progress to where the Big Woods used to be where Food Line is, and the Big Woods used to be where Farm Fresh is. There were no stoplights. And, you know, we've made some progress, and I think that's great. We brought in some small businesses, and that's one concern I have, is if we let industry uh, centers enter in. And I understand we need tax revenues. But if we let them come in, we're losing all of those who have supported Pocosin for years and years and years. And I hate to see that happen. The traffic issue, again, all you have to do is look at Victory Boulevard and Jefferson Avenue, and that was very poor planning on traffic with that. So we have to make sure that we hold our integrity as a small town. That's why I moved here, because it was out of town. I worked in Newport News, and I wanted to get away from that at that time. And I think we're going to really lose out if we lose our small town uh, ideology. And uh, we're going to lose a lot of people, I'm afraid, also. I moved my parents in from California out here because I knew that they'd be safe and that they'd have the convenience of everything around. But I really feel like uh, we can really be threatened by external uh, companies coming in and taking away our small town integrity. So I hope that you'll support that ordinance and we'll keep track of that as we move forward. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? If not, I'll close the public hearing and uh, ask council for consideration. Mr. Mayor, I move we adopt an ordinance <clears throat> amending the zoning ordinance by revising Article uh, Roman numeral 11.1, General Commercial District, Section 11.1-2, Permitted Uses. Second. A motion made and seconded that we approve the ordinance, and that would be the ordinance as written, with no <coughs> amendments. That was disposed of the second reading. Would you like? Yeah. You want to amend your I motion? Did. All right. You got that one in the second. Did you want to agree with his? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, one thing that I'm going to want to make sure. Um, because we owe it to staff to make sure that they uh, uh, hand, uh, enforce this properly, and that is uh, council's intent. I'm assuming council's intent is to apply this zoning ordinance as it uh, applies directly to that development across the street. In other words, we're not going to say, "Well, we did that." What we what staff needs to know is. Are we expecting them to enforce this for that particular development? In G2. Right. CG, rather. G. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can you make it retroactive? Because they've made an offer on the property. Essentially, what you're saying is it's going to be retroactive. That's, that's basically what I think uh, staff is looking for guidance on. Can, can we I, legally can do that? I don't think we can. I think that's a that's a what does an offer as we better be sure of what does an offer All right, hold include on. well uh, that's not vested rights say again an offer is not sufficient to establish vested rights that's what I thought there may be a dispute in this case as to whether or not their rights are vested since they have gone further than simply making an offer 
but there is statutory guidance as to what constitutes a vested right. And I would say to you, I, it's not perfectly clear in this case whether they have vested rights or not. If you pass this ordinance, then I think what the mayor is saying is, do you intend for it to apply to CRES or not? Depending on whether or not you are of the opinion that they have vested rights based on the, the extent that they have gone in, in, in the project. So we want to make that, that clear. I mean, I, I, I no, I, I think it's clear. I just want to make sure, and it doesn't have to get in the way of the vote. We have to do that right. separately. We can we we can entertain that, but simply stated, I think we owe staff an answer because we don't want to be caught into into this. You know, well, it, we passed it, but it doesn't really apply to that that particular project. Yeah, I'd like if to we, discuss if we the feel ordinance that. and and do that, and then discuss that later because that's a separate issue as far as I'm concerned. I, I think we need to. So why are we doing this? That's that's the only thing I would ask this question. Well, I I, I certainly if this is this is uh, decision time for the council. Okay. Uh, in just my elementary way of thinking, you know, the only reason that we're here tonight is talking about that development. I simply want to make sure, and, and I am open to a vote, positive or negative on this particular ordinance. If you don't believe in this ordinance, then, and you think it puts us in a, in a bad light in, in terms of development, I respect that. But the main reason that we're here to vote on this is because of CRES. I don't think so. I think it's yes. broader than that. Well, uh, uh, I, I think the genesis of this is exactly as the mayor says, that, that it came about aimed at one particular business. Yep. And I think we were looking for a silver bullet, and I'm afraid we we're coming up with a fragmentation grenade. It's going to have an impact on a lot of other businesses other than the one that it was intended to stop. Uh, not, not speaking in favor of the Walmart business, I'm just saying I'm concerned about the well-being of the business community in the city. And I I'd like to speak to that because I started there. 100% I started there um, thinking this is to stop Walmart and um, while I'm not a fan of Walmart I and I and I'm not a fan of big government um, I think that particularly some of the speakers who spoke tonight made very good points in that we really didn't know it was a problem until the Walmart incident um, brought it to light and whether it this applies to Walmart or not and that's why I said we should talk about that as a separate issue whether this apply whether if we adopt this or not whether we apply it to Walmart I think we need to th that's a separate issue for me but I do think we owe it to our citizens to discuss protecting the the traffic on Victory Boulevard and the amount of development we allow um, at the entrance to our city. I was not a fan of allowing the whatever we just is going to happen in the big woods on this side. You know, I voted no on that one, um, on selling that to begin with, but um, thinking that was too much traffic. And I think that any sort of business on the opposite side of the woods is going to, or on the opposite side of the street, is going to bring a lot of traffic. So we need to be careful about what's built there. I don't know that I want the city seven people being in charge of determining that. I, but I, I think it's worth discussing. I agree with Ray, and I, I, I don't agree with this ordinance. You know, I think back of all the previous councils that have tried to develop the big woods to no avail, and we've hired professional people to tell us what's the highest and best use of the big woods. And we zone the big woods based on their information, professional information that we trusted. We, we matched the zoning to it. We created an EDA so that they could make deals with developers that we don't, we cannot make to make it easier for the developer. We put, told our planning department to sell this city. The Coastal is the place. Bring your business here. And, and I think it's this is sending a message not only to businesses that we don't want them and we're not interested in them, but to our own staff. 
I mean, we geared them up, told them. I would look at this list of who's got to get, get a conditional use permit, and every one of us says, oh, I'd love to have one of those here. I'd love to have one of those. And I disagree with the fact that, yeah, nobody's going to develop all of that piece of land at, at one time. They can't because it's owned by probably 100 different people. This is the only piece that's big enough to interest somebody with a big project. So a mom and pop may buy a piece in that big general commercial area, and now we're going to put this burden on them. Uh, it's just big government coming to this city, and I'm not for it. Well, I, I, I want to make a comment there also. You heard my questions earlier about how much would this cost the business who wanted to go in there. Uh, and although this, according to some people, may have been brought up solely by Walmart, okay, the, the reason I seconded it and wanted it to come up was because I've heard what's been said by a lot of people. They would, they would like to have businesses that have a significant impact on the city come up before a forum of people that were elected for and by the citizens of the city of Pocosa. Okay? That, you know. Being said, I'm sorry the name Walmart was brought up because I do not feel that I have the right, okay? Matter of fact, I'm relatively certain I don't have the right nor this council to say which businesses can come to this city, okay? Which businesses can get competition and which businesses cannot get competition. Nor do I want that right. I don't want to say who can build next door to me, whether I like them or not, whether they're, not, they're my religion or not. I do not want those rights, okay? I do not Great. want. I don't, I don't want this council to have those rights. My sole purpose for seconding this was to give the citizens an opportunity to have comment before a board of elected officials. Um, and I'm concerned about the cost of business. Well, we, we have a general. We, we have a mixed use business. We're trying to get business in Pocosin, and Buddy's right on that. We've been trying to get business in this city for a long time. Okay. Fortunately or unfortunately, that's the only business that's right now applied to spend their money to do that. So, I'm, But I'm not going to make this about them, okay? The reason I seconded it was to give the citizens an opportunity to speak their opinions and to make certain that there are none, no unintended consequences of what we do. Uh, if, if a business of any kind was to come in and have a significant impact on the city that would require major changes to our water lines and major changes to our sewage systems, okay, that we simply can't afford and, and there's no secondary access, then we might have to do something we didn't intend to in, the, in those cases. But I don't want to stop a mom and pop from being, being able to come in here and make it unaffordable to come to this city. And uh, I've had people say, do we just raise my taxes? Well, I know a lot of people in this city who are retired, a lot of people who just don't pay high-paying jobs and they just can't afford to have their taxes raised. And nor do I want to run any of them out of the city because we're doing that, because we keep business from coming in. And so I hate that that the last part of the vote was brought as part of this issue. Okay? I think it would be good to have the, 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 the opportunity for citizens to have input on significant impacts to the city. Uh, but I don't know about the other part. Which right. part? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. It bothers me some that anybody that wants to bring a business in here from anywhere can get uh, the few folks on the EDA to approve it and can do it without any elected public official body even looking at it. And if that's a, a roadblock, a hindrance, an obstruction, uh, I think that it's okay to live with that. But I, I, I got to agree with you on that. What, what this has done to me, it's taken the the voice away from the people. This is kind of putting the voice back to the people, as we've heard loud and clear, and putting it back to this board. Um, the Walmart separate thing aside, <coughs> I, I'm going to go for this ordinance having no bearing on the Walmart. I, as far as I'm concerned, the Walmart may happen, and that might take a whole different board of people, whether that's coming here or not. Might be seen or heard somewhere else. Um, but I think this is going to... We don't have the infrastructure. When, the, when VDOT, when this road out here, um, the funding, um, that hurts that project, hurts any big project. 
Um, and until we get the infrastructure, I personally don't think we um, anything too big out there. So this gives us an opportunity to, for us to have a say so on it and the citizens to have a say so. And it doesn't mean we're going to disapprove it. Absolutely. It just means it's going to come before the elected body. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the, the question that started the whole conversation, right? right? Do that. Okay. <laughs> so do we expect this to apply to CRES? I don't think we can answer that right now. <clears throat> but if we do the no second reading, it becomes effective in, what, 30 days? And then it will apply however it does. And that's a chance I'm willing to risk if they want to bring a lawsuit. Okay, so I got one. Are we, are we, are we voting? No, no, no. no I'm making reading. sure. I'm making sure that 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 staff knows if the vote is positive, uh, how to apply this. I'm assuming that it, you know we're going to, and I'll tell you what. I'll just state it, and y'all can tell me if you Could disagree. Could we not with receive it. legal counsel on this outside of this forum I think first? We have. I think I think he's already given you the legal counsel he that you need. They don't have a right. I've, I've, I've given each one of you a complete breakdown on what vested rights are. All right. Okay. And I've discussed it with each one of you. Okay. I'm not going to sit here and okay. make a decision in a public forum without right, all of the facts as to whether or not that it applies. Right. Okay. That, that, that's stated. more than I'm smart enough to do. Right. So simply stated is the intention that uh, y'all disagree with me. Feel free, really. Um, the intention is, if this passes tonight, that we're going to enforce it on CRES. That's what I, yeah, if this passes tonight, it becomes uh, law in 30 days. I don't know whether we're forcing it. I think we're calling their hand, and then they'll, they'll play their hand. Correct. I mean, you know, we're not we're dealing here. with some little fly-by-night outfit here, you know. Yep. I, I still say that this, this whole ordinance uh, was aimed at Walmart. There's I'm, no doubt. I'm willing to bet if a Trader Joe's was going to be the thing going there, people saying, "Hey, great, we need that here in town." Yeah, hey, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just, so I'm, I, I'm just, I, I I'm just stating the obvious. The, sure. elephant, the elephant's in the room, so you yep. know, you may as well just talk I, I about think, the I elephant. think this got okay. missed. This has been missed. Yeah. Somehow, in the, the comprehensive plan or whatever happened, and this is just my opinion. This got missed. There's no way that you should have a group of people can dictate what the citizens want versus the city, in the city council together. I just, just, in my, just again, that's my gut. I just think it got missed. I, I think now we're fixing it. And if you let the chips fall where they fall. Um, well, in every zone, you've got buy right, can, buy right things that can be built. And General Commercial has buy right they could build what they wanted to build. Really, really, when I look at this list, I don't see what you can build in there, to be quite honest with you. And I, when I look at this list, I'm sitting there going, well, that's pretty much everything. Yeah. Um, huh? yeah. So I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with any of the arguments. I hear, what, I hear what Councilman Green says and what Councilman Bernal says, and I agree with both of them. I also hear, I, I, I hear what, what you all are saying as far as citizen input. You know, that's okay. Got that. Want that, too? But simply stated, um, you're either going to, when we, when we do this, I intend to make sure the city manager enforces this on CRES. If you, have, if you disagree with that, then what I'm saying is you need, now's your time to, to vote against it. Okay, because the direction is we, in, we intend for them to enforce this on CRES. Okay, that's, that's the only thing. I just want to make clear that staff hears it, that it's recorded in the minutes, yeah. and that that's what we're going to do. That's, that's what staff is going to do. Um, that way there's no ambiguity. There's no, uh, the group out here is sitting here waiting for the next shoe to fall. Okay, just make your intention clear. All right, so I have a motion made and seconded. By enforce it, you mean bring it before council mm -hmm. or their decision? Correct. Okay, I'm good with that. Okay, okay. Um, so the, uh, the motion is to pass the ordinance, not, in, not including the uh, vehicle count, um, and uh, to, to do it on the first reading and not the second. So wave the second reading. Wave the second reading. 
You say not including the vehicle count? Not including the vehicle count. Okay. That's, what, that's what's been made and approved. Yes. Why do we not include the vehicle count? Did we not want to include the vehicle count? Uh, I don't know what it means. You know, what's 75 per hour? Is that a lot? Is that a little? I don't, I don't know. Wasn't it a standard that was in other cities? I have a motion made and seconded. You know, do we want, do you want to change your motion? Okay. Uh, not with the info I have now. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Now we could add it back in if we find something different. Okay. In another meeting. Anything else? So there's no question you are voting on the ordinance is set forth in the book packet and it does not include the suggested language from the planning uh, planning. That's correct. That's correct. Yes. Okay. And it waived the second reading. Waive the second reading. Judy, please. Councilman Green. No. Councilman Bernal. Aye. Councilman Ayer. Aye. Councilman Southall. Aye. Councilwoman Crawford. Aye. Vice Mayor Freeman. Aye. And Mayor Hunt. Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of six to one. Now, um, I'm going to uh, leave the agenda for a minute, and uh, Dr. Thomas, if uh, you can do your presentation. I'm sorry for the uh, traffic delays. You know, you probably had to come down Victory Boulevard, you know, is really uh, <laughs> Actually, as an economist, I was very intrigued with a very active and smart citizenry in discussing those ideas. It, it needs to be discussed here. Yes. I left Hampton at 3.30 to arrive at a 5 o'clock meeting with the city manager of Virginia Beach, got there at 6. The infrastructure doesn't support what they're trying to do. <laughs> and then it took me another hour and a half to get back. So I have spent three and a half hours on the road to do two 10-minute meetings. But, well, so, thank you. Thank but you. it's very, very good to hear. Thank you, for, thank you for coming here again this evening, and we look forward to uh, hearing from you. And I'll be done very, very quickly. Lastly, I wanted to say I am not a native Virginian, but I've heard so much about Pocosin, and I really love the way the small town setting you have here with a lot of and things that are very, very good to see and do, and your school system, so you ought to be commended on what you do with that. The reason I'm here today is that I would like for the city council, who's always been a very, very big supporter of Hampton University and our cancer center, to, to support us one more time. And it's very simple. We're not asking the Commonwealth of Virginia for money out of the General Assembly. We're asking them for money out of the tobacco settlement funds. They have about $1.5 billion of funding, and most of that has been wasted and not have been used for the efficacy of helping folks with cancer. As you may or may not know now, cancer is the number one, has the number one mortality rate for Virginia, the only state in the, in the United States that has cancer, not heart disease, that's the number one uh, mortality rate. In addition to that, cancer is going to increase on average 36% over the next 10 years. The highest increases are going to be in cities like James <coughs> County, Virginia Beach, Northern Virginia, um, because we're getting older. And you get older, you're going to have issues with, with cancer. And we are put in a position here of being able to use high technology to alleviate some of the pain and some of the comfort. Some of the things we're doing now, we've seen over 1,200 patients, and it's getting bigger. And basically what we're doing that makes it uniquely different, of course, there's no harsh side effects from regular radiation or surgery. In addition to that, cancer can now be treated through what they call telemedicine, telehealth. So you don't have to go to a hospital. They can bring robotics down to you. And this is going to be especially helpful to veterans. As you know, our Hampton VA had one of the worst records of admitting patients and seeing patients. And actually, patients were dying with prostate cancer because they just couldn't get an appointment. And we think that we can help with that, and we're asking the governor and the Tobacco Commission to support us on that. The other issue in our General Assembly ask is for a weather satellite. A Pocosin resident, uh, Pat McCormick, a former NASA uh, employee, he and his uh, colleague, Dr. Uh, Bill Smith, created a satellite 10 years ago. This satellite has the ability to predict the landfall of hurricanes within 100 miles 24 hours in advance, believe it or not. 
The mm -hmm. technology was developed by Goddard and NASA and, and by the American Weather Service. Unfortunately, we sold that intellectual property to the Russians, the Chinese, and the Europeans. And they have satellites flying right now that is protecting their citizenry. Let me give you a good example of that. The last predicted storm that was supposed to come directly across and hit Hampton Roads. We continued to plan our activities because we knew that the hurricane was going to be 300 miles out to sea because we used that advanced technology. And what we're going to do, we're going to place that satellite dish on top of one of our buildings in downtown Hampton. So the next hurricane season, we'll be able to use, the last time I remember there was a European model and there was the American model. The American model is that they take an airplane and fly it through the eye of the hurricane, then they throw canisters and balloons up in the sky. The European model that was designed from the technology advanced and, and created by Americans used low-flying satellites to do all of those calculations using supercomputers. And that's the technology that we're going to have. So next time, we won't say that the hurricane is going to be from Florida to New, to New Jersey. It'll be within 100 miles, and you can predict it. The next step, and I, what we did, too, we protested the selling of that technology. It was so god-awful that we would allow that to happen as Americans, but we did. But that European satellite now is flying in Europe and over China, and they're able to predict not only that, but also the landing of tornadoes. So we want to bring that technology to Virginia, and it does two things. Number one, the, the good kids that you guys are preparing in your great schools need STEM jobs. And a meteorologist with that kind of technical education, with science background, will be able to get, get good jobs and not like every last one of my kids stay in this area and not leave. So there's a tremendous upkick on that as well. So what I wanted to do was, again, to tell you two things. Number one, we're not asking for any money from this, the Commonwealth. We're taking money from the tobacco settlement. And the other issue with regard to placing the satellite dish in Hampton, we're going to do it whether or not the state gives us money or not. It's just too good of an investment. It just saves so much money. I don't know how much your city council wasted money on doing all the precautions of thinking a hurricane was going to come here or leaving town, but we can get this technology in as developed by one of your own, uh, Dr. McCormick. So those are the two things that we're asking you to, to help us support. And again, you've been very, very good. We have lots of patients that are coming from Pocosin and from Tidewater because Tidewater is one of the areas with the shipyard, with mesotheliomia, with all those kinds of things, has one of the highest concentration of cancer death in the entire Commonwealth. We need to do something about that. We need to figure out what's going on and what's wrong with this to make this happen. We'll think we'll do it. I think I have a short clip. Is that it's loaded. ready to go? If we can do that, then I'll be done with you. But again, congratulations for an involved citizenry. I really, really enjoyed listening to you guys. In so we'll listen to that. Did anybody have any questions? I'll be around and hang around later. Thank you so very much. Thank you. My brother uh, had prostate cancer. Uh, I found out really I had prostate cancer was in April of uh, 2014. How you doing? My name is Lawrence Davis. I'm with the Hampton Roads Prostate Forum. Okay. If you have a cancer, Proton is the best way to get it taken care of. Well, I in turn decided to go with Proton. The VA told me they would not do that. Wouldn't even pay the 20% that I need to pay uh, for doing it under Medicare. It says Proton Beam Therapy has not been deemed as appropriate option. So his request has not been approved. After reading this letter here and looking at what uh, Medicare has paid, uh, for me being a, uh, a retiree, I could not afford the extra cost of paying that extra 20%. And so I raised hell back and forth about no, I can't have this, I won't have it. This thing has got to get out of me some kind of way or another. Cancer does not discriminate. Cancer strikes the old, the young, black, white. And what we're trying to do here at Hampton University Proton Therapy Institute 
is to have a place that gives those people hope. We treat all types of cancers, including GI, lung, head and neck, prostate. For prostate cancer, patients treated with proton beam radiation, the GI complication rate drops to one half of one percent. And that is just a remarkable improvement over what we can achieve with our regular x-ray based treatments. It's in fact a tenfold improvement and we're very proud to be able to offer that for our patients. There was no side effects, none. I was able to function in my job. Uh, it, it was the most unbelievable experience of my life. Brain and spine, breast, and pediatric. <laughs> Derek starts coming through and he sees the mohawk. The nurse points it out the first day and taps on the glass and is like, hey look. And his face, he just lit up like Christmas, which made me light up like Christmas, and we're just so happy. It was so exciting and just to, to share a connection with someone and, and, and know that I can make someone stay a little better. How do you feel? Good. How good? Very good. And clearly, proton therapy eases human misery and saves lives. That bell signifies the completion of a patient's fractionated course of radiation therapy. So they have been through usually anywhere from four to nine weeks of daily radiation therapy and for them ringing that bell means they are finished their completed therapy, moving on to the next phase and hopefully cure to their tumors. Oh, that's the best part of the day is when I hear the bell. We celebrate just as much as everyone out in the, out in the lobby. We need a universal approach to funding, whether it be from private donations, whether it's from state funding, whether it's from the federal government in order for us to continue our mission of saving lives and eating human misery. Joanne uh, worked uh, very hard for the proton treatment city for the funding for it because she thought it was very important to the community. She had breast cancer, she was diagnosed in uh, 2005 or six, and she uh, up in uh, DC. And when she got out, it came out of, out of the cancer treatment, out of the surgery and all, they said she was, she was totally cancer free. And then within a year, it came back, and it came back with a vengeance. I think she would probably say that there are some things that we could do without, and some things that we need to fund. But surely she would think that the Proton Treatment Center at Hampton University is, is one of those areas that need to be funded. It's so important that we have options other than just chemotherapy and surgery. I was given only three options of treatment. Cryogenics. Prostatectomy. I could have the seeds put in. Or standard radiation. Or I can do external radiation. I said, you've left one out. He said, what's that? I said, proton therapy. He said, well, there's not enough outcomes. Well, I knew there were outcomes. I had done enough research to know that they were outcomes. The University of Florida published the results of a five-year prospective study that demonstrated a 99% freedom from PSA progression at five years for both low-risk and intermediate-risk prostate cancers. These doctors, even though I question <coughs> the ethics of it, were going to direct me into their radiation program. In the United States, we tend to try to keep our patients within the vertical tiers of hospital integration, which is a fancy word for saying the folks in one hospital system like to keep their patients all within that hospital system. I would hope that my physician would sit down with me and take off his brand and take off his hospital association and speak to me with the honesty of a physician um, because that's really what I'm coming to him for. There are many patients who cannot necessarily afford uh, to get this treatment, so we have established a fund here through our gala to help to pay for those costs, out-of-pocket costs to those patients. In order for us to uh, complete this mission, uh, it helps us with giving funding and funding assistance to uh, veterans like Mr. Lawrence Davis. I have been praying for uh, there will be some kind of way that I can do this. I've learned about Photon, and I've learned about what Dr. Harvey was doing, because I like that guy. 
the finance department of the uh, Town <coughs> Center. What they did, they went out and searched and found funds for me. And I found that the funds come from uh, gators and different things that they give <coughs> to help indigent people. I'm just so excited that I'm, that I'm going forward with this. Uh, say now, bring on the program. <laughs> Yes, indeed. to you and we always will keep uh, Procolson in our hearts. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you for bringing all that. For I, Mr. Mayor, if I could, I'd just Dick like to say something before Dr. Thomas leaves. Uh, I can personally attest to the greatness of the proton therapy because I got to ring the bell. And before the proton therapy at Hampton Institute was built, I had a prostatectomy and thought everything was hunky-dory, but it came back. And I can tell you, the only side effect to the proton therapy, and it, it, I, it's almost been a year now, and I'm, I'm sure they got it, the only side effect, the only inconvenience was I missed a few days of golf. Okay. <laughs> but you can't, you can't help that. But I tell you, we, can't, we could not support a better institution or a better thing. And what really breaks my heart is the article they had in the Daily Press mm -hmm. that they're not meeting the, the anticipated numbers. But I can tell you why, and I'll probably get in more trouble than I did for voting no against the amendment for saying this, but the local hospitals will not support it because they've got their own little game. Mm -hmm. And they'd rather put you through radiation or some other treatment that's theirs instead of going to this that is a known cure. And I, I, I can tell you, I, I met two people uh, while I was there, and one a lady was having, uh, she had throat cancer. And I know a good friend of mine here in Pocosin died of that. He had the radiation, and he couldn't taste, he couldn't eat, he couldn't, he couldn't swallow half the time. I heard her tell the doctor <clears throat> when asked when her therapy was over, they, she, they said, uh, well, what's the worst side effect that you've got? She said, I've got a sore throat. So it is the greatest thing since sliced bread, I'm telling you. And, and thank and you for being no, no, here. Thank you. And, and again, I want to really appreciate uh, the city of Colson. Maybe 15 years ago when they were thinking about developing the NIA, which they put in Hampton, we told them to forget about aerospace because that wasn't the way to go. We told them that they should do green, the earth, warming, global warming. And you guys had partnered with us to put that in Pocosa. If we had, the city had listened, not city, but NASA had listened to us, we would again been on the top edge of cutting technology that would have been very, very beneficial. So again, I just applaud you guys and thank you so, so very much for being supportive and we'll continue to do the best we can. Mr. Thank That's you so fun. much. Again, thank you for coming this evening. Oh, yes. Several items of new business here. The second one is dealing with the legislative agenda of Hampton University. I'm, I'm sure that won't be an issue. But the first is approval of a conduit uh, debt issuance for Beth Shalom, home of Virginia. And uh, basically, just so everybody's aligned here, this is basically a pass-through uh, debt very similar to what we have done um, with the YMCA in York County. I know that uh, Randy's talked to each one of you uh, back, back, when, back when we did that, uh, but basically it's taking advantage of the EDA's deadline. Uh, but I've, obviously we all are aware that the EDA's deadline is our deadline. So let me um, let me take a shot at that. Okay. I can't say all this, Teresa. Would you let me take a shot at? It? All right. State law allows economic development authorities and IDAs duly constituted to issue what they call conduit debt up to $10 million per year. Um, this, they are conduit for the debt. And in this case, 
would be our EDA with your consent um, issuing the debt. It does not impact our credit rating. It does not impact our debt service. It does not impact our ability to borrow um, our debt our debt caps of our own. The only thing that it does is it limits our ability to issue tax-free debt through the ADA for the balance of the calendar year, which is why we wait this late, because there is nothing that we're planning to borrow money for in the next 16 days. Um, what this also does for the EDA is they make a small um, fee for being the conduit for this type of debt. There will, over the course of years, there will be projects, YMCA is an example, sometimes particularly in, in, in a little larger sized communities, sometimes you need other people to help you with their debt and um, uh, other communities and in this particular instance we were asked uh, to, to assist with this conduit debt. We have folks here that can answer additional questions, but essentially, um, it's it's a conduit and it does no negative impact, even if the debt completely defaulted. And we get a little money. And right. the EDA gets a little bit of, of money. And we also did it for a project in New News, didn't we? We did. Yes, sir. Yeah. And Kevin White, Bond Council, is here too. In case you had any questions from Bond Council. Well, we don't have any questions, but please come <laughs> and, uh, Thanks. and tell uh, us all about it. I'll be very <coughs> brief then. Uh, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Kevin White with Kaufman & Canoles, and I'm representing Beth Shalom, home of Virginia, which is actually located up in, in Rico County outside of Richmond. Uh, they are um, looking, we're looking for a small, a qualified small issuer like Pocosin to issue bonds uh, late in the year, as, uh, as your city manager explained. And... I'll emphasize again that there's no fiscal uh, responsibility on the part of the city to pay any of the debt service. It's all passed through. It's uh, You're more in the sense of a, a lender than a borrower uh, on this sort of thing. Uh, the credit is coming from a commercial bank, so you are really passing that through to the borrower. But for that, you are uh, permitted by law to charge a fee of uh, 12 and a half basis points of the principal amount per year. That's pretty much it. Uh, Best Shalom is a, a senior living facility up in Enrique. Hey, thank you very much. All right, is there a motion? Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt a resolution of the City Council of the City of Percussion, Virginia, regarding the issuance of a revenue and refunding bond by the Economic Development Authority of the City of Pocosin, Virginia, and the loan of the proceeds thereof to Beth Shalom, <coughs> home of Virginia. Second. A okay, motion made and second that we approve this uh, uh, conduit debt issuance. Questions or comments? Not Judy, please. Councilman Southall. Aye. Vice Mayor Freeman. Aye. Councilman Bernal. Aye. Councilman Green. Aye. Councilman Ayer. Aye. Councilwoman Crawford. Aye. And Mayor Hunt. Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of 7 to 0. Thank you. The next item is a resolution supporting the Hampton University's legislative agenda and priorities. Is there a motion on that? Mr. Mayor, I happily move that we adopt a resolution in support of Hampton University's legislative agenda and priorities. I happily second. <laughs> and, uh, okay. Uh, questions or comments? Okay. Judy, please. Councilman Ayer. Aye. Councilwoman Crawford. Aye. Councilman Green. Aye. Vice Mayor Freeman. Aye. Councilman Southall. Aye. Councilman Bernal. Aye. And Mayor Hunt. Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by vote is 7 to 0. Okay, thank you very much. We hope to see you again, Dr. Thomas. Okay. Uh, next item under new business is an ordinance making additional appropriations and transfers for fiscal year. 2015 and 2016. Um, I think we've had a chance to look at them, but uh, I'll let you review them for the uh, audience. Mr. Mayor, if I could, I'll ask our finance director, Teresa Owens, to come forward and present them, and then when she's done, I do have one or two every comments if I could, could make them, please. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, each year about this time, um, after the audit is complete, staff come to council for the purpose of reappropriating various carryover um, items um, that weren't previously spent, as well as some other restricted items that we've received since July 1st. Um, the first part of the ordinance does just that. Some of these things are um, donations that we've gotten in the library, fire fund, for for life money, 
um, asset forfeiture money. Also included in this are the additional revenues that we've gotten. Some of those are, include um, the asset forfeiture money. We've gotten a couple of grants, the DMV selective, uh, selective grants, L LMGP grant, and a grant we received to um, purchase an airboat for the fire department. Um, in addition, in the capital projects funds, um, there are appropriations that are unexpended. For pro if, if there are appropriations, if they're, if, if they're unexpended after three years, need to be reappropriated into year one. And some of those included um, some drainage um, improvements, Kids Island, and then there was um, an appropriation for some large some, for some facility projects um, should they come up. Uh, in addition, one of the other things that's in here is um, the request from the school division to um, appropriate the unexpended funds from fiscal year 15. Um, Dr. Parrish has asked that these funds be reappropriated for the local match for security grant as well as um, any other equipment for security reasons that are not covered under the grant. Then the last, the last three items um, have to do with unbudgeted needs that, that we've had um, that weren't in the, in the 16 budget that we weren't able to, um, to do last year. And some of those, in, um, the, one of the reasons that we are able to do this is because we had a slight increase in our unbudgeted revenues, and we also had vacancies in both the fire, police department, public works. And then um, departments were really responsible in spending their, their budgeted numbers. So we ended up um, at the end of fiscal year 15 with an unrestricted fund balance exceeding our 15% adopted policy of $947,000. Um, because of this, staff is recommending and requesting an appropriation of three one-time expenditures. The first being um, in the Public Works Department. Um, in the CIP, in the recommended CIP budget, there was um, a request for the purchase of a dump truck. But since that time, the Public Works Director has determined that um, a street sweeper is a higher priority and is, and is bigger need at this time. So we're asking for $240,000 to be appropriated for the tr street sweeper. The next item is, um, has to do with the RS cost. One of the, uh, one of the ways the state um, tried to help local governments through the recession was to allow the governing bodies to adopt what they call an alternate rate as opposed to the board certified rate. Um, the city decided to do that <coughs> in order to help us through the recession, but it didn't alleviate the city from the liability. Therefore, we're asking through the fund, through the savings, through the vacancy savings that we have in fiscal year 15, to pay that difference off, and that was $112,000. Then the last one we are asking um, for is to fund um, a floating dock out at Rims Road. I understand there, there is a need over there for a floating dock for the sailing program and some other needs for the citizens of the city. With all that, as well as there's two additional appropriations later on in the agenda, if approved, as well as those approved, we'll have um, the fund balance in excess of the 15 percent will be about $427,000. So I'll answer any questions. Any questions of Teresa? Well, generally, it may not be for Teresa. Do we know where we're going to put the floating dock, roughly? Uh, yes, sir. And Ms. Ms. Roberts can speak to that. Uh, yes, we're Come forward so everybody else can hear you, please. Looking at the city dock at White House Cove, where we have the pump out station now, mm -hmm. um, we've got a preliminary RFP that, or a draft RFP that we're finishing up now. So, on, down on the end of the city dock? Uh, beside it. Beside it, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great. If I could, um, yeah. just a few comments. I won't go back over the entire list, but. Uh, one of the things that, that we've tried to do as staff, and certainly you've done, is to to bring us fully through the recession by adhering to strong financial principles. And one of the things that we're trying to do with the actions on your agenda this evening, you'll see with this, uh, this funding identified in, in excess of the fund balance target, we're going back primarily priorities dealing with obligations we already have, Mm -hmm. That's the VRS one. That needs to be paid. It, it, it already exists. Um, 
The CIP, as you know, equipment replacement you'll call two years ago, we had an extensive work session on all of the various uh, equipment replacement issues that all the departments had, including the schools. So investing in that, taking um, up from the adopted CIP and advancing the ball on that, um, and also um, the other two items, I'll almost speak to them when we get to them. But, but one question that I've gotten from several folks is, what in the world do we need an airboat for? And I thought I'd just go ahead and answer that question if I could. Um, the first time I ever thought about the need for an airboat, or a capacity, the airboat became the, a possible answer for it, was in 2009 during the Twin Nor'easter. That was my first storm here. And we had three and a half days where a large portion of the city had water over top of the red. Particularly at night, uh, we've been blessed in, in the, the emergency events that I've been here for that we haven't had a large number of critical health issues that we just had to help folks with. But um, we do try in emergency situations to get in the inundation area, typically take that, that deuce and a half, which we promptly put in the ditch, because at night, particularly, when the water's covered in the deep dish ditches that we have, there really is no practical and reliable way, uh, and we're not talking about things other than sort of extreme health emergencies. I'm mindful this is not some kind of thing we're just going to sort of tool around and see things are going. But um, it will give us a capability to get into the flooding inundation zones, um, whether that's two inches of water or two feet of water. And um, there are many other uh, uses, but that was where it was in my mind as we debriefed the first study because we clearly we needed a better way than than the deuce and a half which was the only option we had at that time and so it kind of sat in my brain as joe breeden who was here on the back with the fire department took the lead and um, was able to to be the point person on the fire boat um, but at the same time, I said to Robert and to Joe, should you ever find an opportunity for a federal or a state grant for an airboat, if you think it's a good idea that's workable, give it a shot. And Joe was used to slaying large dragons and getting stuff done, and he found it. So this is a 100% grant that will pay for the acquisition and the training that goes with it. And I'm hopeful it will help us save lives that otherwise we couldn't, folks, we couldn't get to. Well, let me also remind you that you floated a fire truck. Yes, sir. That was prior to my arrival, but yes, we did do that, and fire trucks do Which float. Do fire trucks do float? And, uh, I'm surprised I didn't make the list. But, uh, no, uh, but uh, no, I, th I think it's, uh, I mean, what can you say when it's, a, when it's a grant? Okay, so thank you very much, Joe, for, uh, for basically sponsoring and writing that grant. And I think it will be, uh, it, it will definitely uh, be a great tool for us. Just one right. question, if I could. Mm -hmm. uh, having taken several rides on Jamie Moore's airboat and talking to him, I think it requires quite an extensive training yes, process Absolutely. to learn how to operate one of these. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And there aren't many places where you learn to do that. Will this grant cover our cost to get? Whoever's going to operate this to Florida to learn how to operate. Actually, he, I asked him this question. Right and can I go with me. you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, as far the as ways. the grant goes, um, between the grant funds and some other funds that we have for training already established, uh, basically what would happen would be the company that we've spoken with would actually come here and do the training. Oh, good. Um, actually, is the yeah. same company that Mr. Moore used. Right. Um, the the lead instructor for that company is actually familiar with the area that we are dealing with. Hmm. Um, in addition to that, it is Department of Interior approved course, which will help us in the long run if we ever are faced with having to go on the marsh or whatever the case may be. Again, just like the city manager said, this is not something that we're looking at to go out and ride around right. with. Uh, this is a tool to be used for life safety. However, we also want to keep in mind that we we may come in contact with the marsh grasses and stuff, and, and we're very particular about that, and, and we want to be by the book. So. Good. Okay. 
Very good. Thank you. All right, any other questions? I have one. When do we go to gray shirt? This is for lieutenants. <laughs> <laughs> That's fancy. This is fancy. Fancy. <laughs> hey, thanks, Jeff. All right, um, is there a motion? Well, I move that we adopt an ordinance to make an additional appropriations and transfers for fiscal year 2015-16. Second. Okay, motion made and seconded. Uh, my only comment is it's great to be uh, running a city that comes in well under its budget, has extra money, that it can do these necessary things, that it has a credit rating that allows us to do conduit <laughs> bonds for other people. I think back in the... Back in the days of, you know, we're really looking for for money, and we, we, we've got to have businesses. Some of that gets overlooked. Uh, great job to you, Randy, uh, and to Teresa, because I know you, every <laughs> check that she writes it gets gets questioned, and uh, I, I'd hate to be the one who has to come looking for 100 bucks to, to, to do something. And uh, she makes me monitor my uh, mayor's account when I go to the seafood festival. And if I'm over by a dollar, it's not pretty. Okay? So, <laughs> so with that being said, uh, thank you uh, to staff uh, for the ability to do things like this. All right. Did Judy? Councilwoman Crawford? Aye. Councilman Ayer? Aye. Councilman Southall? Aye. Vice Mayor Freeman? Aye. Councilman Brunel? Aye. Councilman Green? Aye. And Mayor Hunt? Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of 7 to 0. <coughs> okay, the next one is an ordinance appropriating funds uh, for the award of a contract for construction of a breakwater at Messick Point and an ordinance appropriating the necessary funding. Mr. Mayor, if I could recognize our city engineer, Ellen Roberts, and a short presentation on this for us. Good evening. Uh, tonight for your consideration are two resolutions. Uh, one authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with Carolina Marine Structures, the low bidder on the Messick Point breakwater um, bid. <coughs> the other is an, a resolution appropriating an additional $53,500 for the project. Um, we had bids. We received five bids on November 23rd, ranging from $192,000 to $311,000. Uh, Carolina Marine Structures was the apparent lo low bidder, and we have um, gone through their bid and, and double-checked their references and their work history. Um, the breakwaters are intended to protect the city infrastructure, uh, specifically the boat ramps, um, and the, the dock assembly down at Messick Point. And they have been on, um, the, the project has been in the process for a number of years. Um, $112,500 of the project is being funded uh, by a Virginia Port Authority grant, a ports grant, um, and that was awarded to the city on May 20th. So any questions or? So it's a combination of grant funding yes. and local funding. Yeah. I only wish uh, Banks Holloway was here to, yeah. to be a part of this vote because this was uh, something he championed for many, many years. So is there a motion to approve this? May I move that we adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with Carolina Marine Structures Incorporated for engineering and construction services with an aid to Ports Grant for the construction and installation of two breakwaters off Messick Point. Second. Motion made and seconded. Questions or comments? Do we know what a timeline is for the actual construction? Yes. Um, if we uh, award the contract by the end of December at the latest, we have uh, the contractor has 90 days to reach substantial completion, which puts them mid to the end of March, and 120 days to final completion, which puts the project end mid-April to the end of April. Great. Thank Perfect. You. That's great. Good. Anything else? Not Judy, please. Councilman Green. Aye. Councilman Bernal. Aye. Councilman Ayer. Aye. Councilman Southall. Aye. Councilwoman Crawford. Aye. Vice Mayor Freeman. Aye. And Mayor Hunt. Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of seven to zero. Okay, the next item under new business uh, is... We've got to do the ordinance. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
The mayor moves that we adopt an ordinance making additional appropriations and transfers for fiscal year 2015-16. Second. Okay, motion made and seconded. Questions or comments? Seeing none, Judy, please. Councilman Southall. Aye. Vice Mayor Freeman. Aye. Councilman Bernal. Aye. Councilman Green. Aye. Councilman Ayer. Aye. Councilwoman Crawford. Aye. And Mayor Hunt. Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of seven to zero. The reason I missed the other one, I, I was sitting there going, are we really going to do something for the assessor? I mean, that's the next item on the next item on the agenda here is an ordinance appropriating funds for <coughs> assessor, no, for assessment software. Sir, uh, sir, come right on up and tell us uh, your name. As, 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 <laughs> as, as Mr. Fays and the city of assessor walks forward, before he starts, I, I just want to tell you that um, one of, I would say, with, when, for, when you're the new city manager, everybody tells you everything real fast and and in this particular case one of the first things I learned about uh, was the need to uh, update and replace this assessment software program which but I don't want to steal anybody's thunder but uh, I will say this because he won't um, through the through, through his good work and his office's good work and all the people that support them we managed to, to take this two assessment cycles longer than I thought was possible. But there is an end to our good luck, and we are the only client left on this. <laughs> um, and is it 2000 or 2003? 2003. It's, it's prepared on a 2003 piece of software. Um, and um, I, I think it's time, given the, the, the relatively long lead time for conversion, that uh, we get about it. And so, so we gave you a computer. Are they paying us to upgrade? <laughs> we, they gave you a, no. <laughs> do, do we have to get him like a new computer, computer also new computer. to run this? Or? Uh, we'll have to get rid of the abacus. <laughs> the, 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 the 2004 version computer. Probably. <laughs> it's crazy. Thank you, Randy. Um, Members of Council, Mayor, I um, appreciate y'all allowing me to come here tonight to make a formal request for the replacement of our uh, assessment software. As Randy mentioned, um, the current software we're using is called Equity, and it's based on an Access Database 2003. And um, there's only one person who maintains this software, and we are the last contractor now using this software and that individual only works on our stuff on a part-time basis so if our system was to go down we'd be in a heck of a mess but but the software has worked very well for us over the years and so forth but like all things it's come to its useful end um so at any rate what uh what it, and, and the other thing too is is that this the software we're using now is not um <coughs> It's not connected to our GIS system. It's not connected to our sales database, the sketch program, photo program, none of that. Um, I integrate all of that stuff manually and send those updates up to our GIS vendor each, each month. So um, it's pretty archaic the way that I'm doing it, but I'm making it work. Um, but at any rate... Um, so um, I've done a little bit of checking around over the years because I knew that we were going to be faced with this at some point in time. And um, most of the figures that I come up with, and there's not many co uh, companies out there that build a software package for small localities, but uh, most of the ones that I've checked into, we're looking in the ballpark of about $125,000. Um, and that's including the data conversion and everything. Um, I know that sounds pretty pricey, but um, when with all the tie-ins and stuff that's involved with it, it's uh, it really pays for itself in the, in the long run. Um, I provided y'all with a, um, a recommended timeline for um, applying the software and moving forward. And um, unfortunately, at this late of the stage, I don't see that how we could make, we could purchase a software package and, and make it work for the next 
physical uh, reassessment. But um, I think that we really need to start moving forward on that so that we can make it uh, make all of the changes that are necessary for the FY20 reassessment. So um, with y'all's approval, I'd like to move ahead with that. Yep. Are there any Good questions? Way. Is there any chance at all that you could get it ready for the 18 or so? Uh, not likely, but because, you know, I think we have to put it out for bid and everything, and, and when you go through all of that process and you research the different companies and they come in and they, you know, um, demo it and everything else, um, and by the time we go through the whole procurement process and everything, I think that we're going to be into late summer um, and trying to install the software right when I'm getting into the meat and bones of the next reassessment. Um, and uh, I'm only a, the appraiser for the whole city, so, um, you know, there's, there's just no way that I could properly, I think, do the next reassessment to the standards that the city's been used to and trying to, you know, um, start with a new program okay any other questions nope thank you. hey thank you very much all right and thank, thank you. you thank you for making that software uh pay off for for so long as 12 years on software that's pretty good amazing. Yeah. amazing is there a motion may i move that we adopt an ordinance making additional appropriations and transfer <coughs> For fiscal year 2015 and 16. Second. Motion made and seconded that we approve this and uh, the ordinance appropriating funds for assessment software. Questions or comments? Seeing none, Judy, please. Councilman Ayer. Aye. Councilwoman Crawford. Aye. Councilman Green. Aye. Vice Mayor Freeman. Aye. Councilman Southall. Aye. Councilman Bernal. Aye. And Mayor Hunt. Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by vote of 7 to 0. Last item under new business is a resolution canceling the second meeting of the month of December. Is there a motion? Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt the resolution canceling the second meeting of the month of December. Second. <laughs> the second. The second before you even got it out. Judy, please, I'm not even asking him for the questions. Councilwoman Crawford? Aye. Councilman Ayer? Aye. Councilman Southall? Aye. Vice Mayor Freeman? Aye. Councilman Bernal? Aye. Councilman Green? Aye. And Mayor Hunt? Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of 7 to 0. Comments to the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a few things this evening. Um, one, I forgot to do this last time, so I'm going to do it first. I just wanted to express thanks to Mrs. Crawford for working with us on the remote participation policy test. We, um, a lot of people worked on that to make sure that we could do that pursuant to your recently approved policies, and, um, and it worked. So thank you and thank everybody that made that work, Bob, Teresa, um, folks from the schools as well. Um, only one other item. Uh, council members may have seen a couple of weekends ago Across Virginia, it was Freedom of Information Act uh, article time, uh, editorials and newspaper stories. And there was one that, uh, that ran in local paper here, and it spoke to an issue uh, in Pocosin of a certain FOIA request. And I just wanted to provide a little uh, additional background to you all that wasn't real clear in the article. Part of it was there if you really searched for it, but... Um, the way they do this, the uh, Virginia Press Association, Daily Press, took the lead this time, but it, it moves around. Uh, they'll go and they make a series of requests on local government school divisions and um, to see what happens, to, to, to test the, the, uh, the system, and, that, and that's a good thing. And um, I, we were subject to uh, City of Coastal 3 uh, tests, and one of them got a little additional uh, press. And essentially, I just wanted to highlight for you and for the community, the issue was uh, a person came in and made a request for a certain record of the police department. The request was vague. Um, the person that received that request processed it based on her understanding um, and asked the requester for his contact information, um, which I think... Um, was interpreted by the requester as being something other than what it was, which, and if you'll just give me a second, you'll understand what it is in a second. 
any time that someone makes a FOIA request, we hope that the person who is at the counter or the first person to touch the issue with them can help them. But always, the request goes as soon as it can uh, as a follow-up to the department head. In this particular case, the police chief, when he uh, was made aware of the request almost immediately thereafter, determined there was sufficient vagueness in the request for a follow-up, which he did again that same day ascertained exactly what it was that the person was asking for and made an appropriate response within one business day of the request. Code of Virginia gives us five days. We did it in one day. Our protocol of making sure requests go up to the, to the department had worked exactly as we intended, which is to make sure um, he was not sure based on the vagueness of the request, immediately followed up, and it went exactly like it should go um, in that sequence. And I'm not sure that that fully came out in the, uh, in the article. And so I thought it was appropriate, um, particularly following a conversation with Ms. Crawford, who had, she, she, she called to say, do you see this? I said, yes, absolutely. The police chief and I just talked about it. And she goes, you know, there's more to the story, and we need to talk about that. So. Um, Chief, I hope I got all the salient points correct, and I thank you for being here in case any member of the council has questions, but uh, you know, we get uh, FOIA requests all the time, and that's okay. That's, that's a good thing, and we don't mind, but we're not perfect, and that's why we have a redundancy protocol which says after you've dealt with somebody, you make sure your department head knows, and he or she will ascertain if there's anything else required or questions that should be asked, and it worked exactly like it was supposed to in this instance. And, uh, Chief, you want to add anything? All the chiefs that were involved across Virginia clearly understand that the testing process can be a necessary part of ensuring compliance with the law. And we certainly have no problem with that. Um, but the person who made the request knew what he wanted and was intentionally vague. So we can hypothetically talk about what might have happened had that been a citizen who didn't know what they want. So to address that issue, we sat down, well, even before I got contacted by the, by the member of the press, and clarified with that clerk um, what those responsibilities are. But because our system requires them to bring that to me, it was properly responded to. But uh, I think it's important to know that, that we are about uh, being open in how we function and, and making records available that, that we're required to make a, you know, available and have a disposition to, to disclose records that, that the uh, public has a right to have. So um, we think that's important. Um, but uh, I think it's the first time we've had a request for that type of information. No citizen has ever asked for it. Um, so, so the test um, was particularly challenging because uh, our full-time administrative assistant's out of town dealing with a sick mother and one of our part-timers handle it. So we've taken care of that and, uh, and given her some guidance on how to handle those in the future and make it more clear. But because it was intentionally vague, and even though the person knew what they wanted, they didn't want to clarify that they wanted to, they were testing her knowledge. But and if you read the article, it appears that we did not respond, and that is totally untrue. We responded. I wrote the letter that day. I just didn't mail it to the next morning and uh, properly responded within the Code of Virginia, quoting from the Code of Virginia, um, and exactly what I'm required to by law. So we, uh, we handled this pretty well, and um, we've never had any issues with that. So, But if we can be better and be more user-friendly, we'll, we'll aim for that. So. Um, but again, it was a good opportunity, and the testing is important, and we understand why they do it. But uh, we just don't want to get caught up in hypotheticals. What we want to get caught up in is making sure that the folks who deal with the public have the best information and the most information they need to determine what's being asked and that the uh, requests are properly followed through. Thanks, Chief. Well, appreciate it. Thanks. And I did contact the newspaper <laughs> reporter um, to clarify that and request that they updated their chart to to reflect that um, because I I the reason I called you was I saw the title of the article and my husband said something about FOIA and I said oh you don't need to read that I'm sure Picosin got 100 percent I knew we would be okay because I know how we operate and I I knew you know we don't hide anything here and we help our of course we help our people and then I read the article and went oh no well they said we didn't do some you know we were it wasn't exactly, you know, it didn't go well. And so that was when I looked into things and thought, well, they need to clarify this because the way it was written was not exactly um, written in the best light for us. So thank you for that. And, and you know, errors happen. So. Anything else, Randy? That's all I have, sir. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, Councilman Southall. I'd like to welcome my new city employee, uh, Ted Kajuri, and uh, thank our city staff for doing such a fine job of preparation for the meeting tonight. And Joe Breeden for his excellence and uh, grant writing. Yeah, he's, he's done a couple of good things for the city, and as city manager for being having the forethought to even consider that. So, thank you very much. Councilman Crawford. Yes, the and other. Uh, stuff that our, our people who work here do. There's a lot of and other. So we, I thank all of you who, who work for the city <clears throat> for the and other that stuff that you do. Um, I also wanted to well echo your comments and thank all the citizens who came up and spoke. That I appreciate your input. It is helpful um, in making decisions. I, I'm, I hate, I personally detest conditional use permits. I don't like the process. I don't like having to make decisions individually. It's so much easier to have a black and white law, follow this law, rather than having to do something, well, how about this for this business and this for that business. But sometimes we need to, you need to factor in certain areas, have special rules. And in this case, I think we've made the right decision for that particular area of Victory Boulevard, um, given where we are and what we know now. Um, and it was not directed at Walmart. You know, I know it may look that way, um, but the fact that it was starting to be developed did bring to our attention we need to do something to just kind of uh, monitor and, and have some input into what, what happens there. Um, Finally, I know this because my uh, youngest son was involved, but the high school drama team ended up advancing and winning the VHSL 3A one-act play state championship. Um, one of the actors in the ensemble, especially, um, what needs to be named, Cole Mercado was actually awarded a Best Actor Award at the state level. He was recognized for his acting all the way up through all the, I think there were four different competitions they had to to win, either come in first or second place to get all the way there, and they kept coming in second in all the competitions, and then they ended up winning first prize at the, at the in Charlottesville when they went this past week, which it was a very big surprise. We they arrived in a rented minivan to get there in Charlottesville, and they went up against some of these drama teams that were coming in two charter buses full of many adults and props and lots of money and, you know, huge programs. And our, you know, five little people on stage took the whole thing. So it was, it was very impressive. So congratulations to them. And so, Judy, would you... Make sure they come. We'll congratulate them. In the state champ, the state champ competitions, the state competitions. So. All right. So, I'd like to see them here and congratulate them.